We're digging uh, deeper, as we've been told, and we've been doing that for a few weeks. And as a professional fence contractor, I uh, dug a few holes myself. But um, it didn't really make me holy, but the message that we're going to hear tonight is going to help us in the pursuit of that. Uh, life by the Spirit. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbour as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Well, good evening. Uh, my name is Joel, one of the pastors here at uh, Wollongong Baptist Church. And, and currently we're in a series entitled Digging Deeper. Uh, and we're specifically looking at the Spirit uh, for three weeks. We started last week and... Uh, one thing I said is, hey, look, I've got three weeks, and so my hope for these sermons is that they'll be a catalyst to you guys to want to dig deeper and to learn more about the Spirit. And I'm actually really thankful that Bob read the Bible uh, tonight. He actually uh, sent me an article this week as he was digging deeper on Galatians 5 and, yeah, modeling to me what it looks like to love Christ and want to be like Him. And so I'm, I'm thankful for his example, for him reading the Word. Um, and so my hope is, is not just Bob, but all of us here will dig deeper into more and know about Christ. And tonight, as we look at this topic of sanctification, we're going to need God's help. And so I'm going to pray. So if you pray with me, that would be great. Father God, we want to thank you so much for the Holy Spirit, who has given to those who receive Christ and have faith in what he's done at the cross for us. Lord, as followers of Jesus, we pray that you help us to obey you. We pray that by your Spirit, you help us to kill sin and to put on righteousness. And Lord, I pray for this time that you be with me as I speak. Help me to uh, forget what needs to be forgotten. Help me to say what needs to be said. Lord, for those of us here tonight that need to be comforted, may you comfort us. For those of us that need to be convicted, may you convict us by your Spirit. And may you point us to Jesus, our Saviour, and help us to be like him. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I'm going to have a story which I'll tell you in a second, but before I do, uh, there's a phone number that will come up on the screen. Uh, that's because we have question time um, after the sermon, so if you've got a question, please get your phone out, text a, a message in. If we've got a few questions, I'll get my crippled friend Mark to come up and help me, uh, but we see how we go. Now, I want you to put your hand up here if you've ever done an Easter egg hunt. Put your hand up if you've ever done an Easter egg hunt. Okay, those who didn't, you missed out on life, but... Um, I remember doing an Easter egg hunt at a farm in Victoria. Uh, it was a place where I used to go on holidays with my dad and my brother. And like every Easter, my dad would lay out Easter eggs so that we'd wake up in the morning and we'd have to go hunting, right? And so you go hunting, you find Easter eggs like around your tent, like around the shed, like near cows and, you know, almost everywhere. And when you do that, you yell back to your dad and you're like, hey, dad, am I close? Am I close? And he'll be like, hotter, hotter, and cold, 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 hot, 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 warm, or whatever you want to say. And he would direct me to find their Easter eggs. Now, I really enjoyed that, but to be honest with you, uh, at the end of that, you know, that pursuit of the Easter eggs, if I was to go up to my dad and ask my dad, I'm I know you're really disappointed in me, but I only found like eight Easter eggs, and I know there's more, I, like, I think you told me there's 10, like, please forgive me, like, I'm sorry. 
like, don't you reckon my dad would have been like, are you crazy? You know, like, the point of the hunt was not that you'd find every single egg, but the point of the hunt was that you'd have fun and that you'd just enjoy, you know, going and looking for eggs. I think sometimes when it comes to the topic of being led by the Holy Spirit, when it comes to trying to understand what God's will is for our life, is I think sometimes we think that maybe we're on this grand Easter egg hunt and that God is yelling out, warmer, 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 no, cold, cold, cold. And so every decision that we're making in life, like, I don't know, who, I guess who we're going to be friends with or maybe who we're going to marry or what jobs we should take, where we should live, we, we've had this, all this pressure of trying to find out what is the exact will of God for our life because we think that trying to find those eggs is actually the whole point of the exercise. When in reality, what God wants for us is, such, is more meaningful and deeper than that. As what we're told in 1 Thessalonians is that God's will is that we'll be sanctified, that we become more like Jesus. You see, what I find interesting is in the Scriptures is actually, like there's only a few people that God reveals their life plan to. Like He does so to Abraham and He says, look, I'm going to you know, send you away from your home to another country. But He doesn't reveal all the details anyway. Or when it comes to who to marry, you know, like the only person I can think of that God told who to marry was uh, Hosea, when he said, you know, marry Gomer, a prostitute, which I don't know about you, if I was Hosea, I'd be like, God, you got that one wrong, like, <laughs> that's, that's not for me. You know, it's interesting that, like, I, I, don't get me wrong here, like, God does care about your life, he does care about who you marry, who, like, I don't know, who you date, or what you do for a job, like, he cares about those little details, but I think sometimes we get distracted from the bigger picture, and I think in, in maybe in our society, in our culture, which is like, you know, all this about trying to find your destiny, your fate, you know, and we think God's got big plans through you because you're going to be like the next Moses or Paul. And I think we can focus so much on ourselves that we actually forget that actually God wants us to be focusing on Jesus and that He gives us the Holy Spirit so we become more like Him. And so tonight, we're going to be looking through this topic of sanctification and the Spirit's role in that. Because as Thessalonians tells us, that's God's will that we will be sanctified. And so what a gift it is, is that we have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who's given to us to help us to make those decisions, yes, but also to be sanctified and to grow in holiness as we live this life. I, I did a research this week throughout the passage of the New Testament about the Holy Spirit. And what you see time and time again is that the Spirit of God does more than sanctify people, but it's also a big role of what He does. And so I want us to learn and dig deeper into this topic because I think it's a big work that He does in our life. And if I'm honest, I think myself, and if you're honest as well, I think sometimes we don't take the pursuit of holiness that serious. And I think we become a bit apathetic towards it. And I think that grieves the Holy Spirit, and He wants us to become more like Christ. And so let's dig deeper tonight into this topic and learn what it looks like for the Spirit to help us in this. And to do that, we're going to look at Galatians. We're going to look at verses 13 to 26. They're the small numbers in the Bible in chapter 5, which is the big number of Galatians. And so let me read out to us the first few verses of Galatians, um, chapter 13 to 15. So Paul says this to the Galatian church. He says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh, rather serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Now, it's important before we unpack those verses that you understand the book of Galatians as a whole and, and how Paul has written to this church who are Christians who have actually got a bit confused. And they thought that salvation is by faith in Jesus plus following the law. And so the Apostle Paul writes to these guys and says, no, 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 salvation is found through Christ alone. You've been redeemed from slavery. You've been redeemed from being under the law. You have freedom now. So stop trying to go back to your legalistic old ways. And here, in verse 13, Paul says to them, Hey, look, brothers and sisters, you were called to be free. He keeps on reminding them that you're free. You're free. And for most of the book, he's like, don't go from that freedom and, and let that lead you towards license. And then here he's also going to say this, and don't allow that, that liberty, that freedom you have, I mean, towards legalism, to go towards license. So what he's saying here is like, Hey, look, you have been freed. You have been loved. You've been saved. Don't fall back into old ways of trying to follow the law, but also don't go into indulging the flesh and sin as well. There's a greater path, the one of sanctification, the one of holiness and being like Christ. And see, what we're going to see in this passage is we're going to learn three things about sanctification. We're going to learn about our need for sanctification. We're going to, we're going to learn about the process of sanctification. And we're going to learn also about the nature of sanctification. And, and here in these first two verses, I think Paul is trying to, he's trying to get us to see the need of, of why we need to grow 
why we need to love our neighbor and, and not to do the opposite. And I think there's, there's two reasons when it comes to thinking about sanctification as to why we need to be sanctified. And I think the first one has got to do with us and our own joy. And like, you know, our, our world yells at us and screams at us and says, you know what, if you want to find joy, if you want to find happiness, if you want to find pleasure, you know, don't worry about following God. Don't worry about following Jesus, but instead just indulge in whatever you want to do. You know, if that's whatever sort of sexual lifestyle you want to live, go that way. Whatever you want to spend money on, do that. Whatever you want to do, whatever you find pleasure, that is what is good. That's what is going to bring you joy. You know what the scriptures tell us actually that there's, there's joy in obedience. That there's joy in following Jesus and becoming more like him. And maybe to the outside world that looks crazy, but for those of us who know Jesus and follow his word and have done that practically, we know that is true, that there is life to the full in following Christ. One illustration that I love, I think Tim Keller says this, is that if you don't know much about fish, and if you look at a goldfish in a fish pole, you might look at that goldfish and think, oh man, that poor goldfish. You know, he's so like constrained in that environment of water. Like he's, he's enslaved to the, to the water in that fishbowl. And you might be tempted to go, let's just pick him out of the fishbowl and let's just put him on the table and say, be free, goldfish, go conquer the world. And if you know anything about goldfish or just fish in general, you're like, you know that would kill the fish. And, and if, you, if, you anything, if you know anything about fish, you know actually that they flourish, they live, and they find life within that little bowl of water. You know, maybe to the outside world, following Christ, it looks constrained. It doesn't look appealing, but actually when you're in that, you realize that there's life to the full. And so maybe remember that on this process of sanctification, that there is joy to be had for us. But also in these verses in particular, I think Paul's trying to make clear to us, and this is something that I know I forget, but there is, I guess, consequences to your holiness or to your sinfulness. And in other words, your pursuit of holiness or your lack of pursuit of holiness, it affects other people. I wonder if you think that through. Like, like, we see what Paul is saying here. You know, he's basically saying, don't use your freedom to be sucked into selfish indulgence, which leads to division. And as he says in verse 15, if you bite and devour each other, watch out or you'll be destroyed by each other. Instead, what he's saying is use your freedom to pursue love, which leads to unity. I don't know about you, but sometimes I forget about this. You know, I think I've got that line in my head that, you know, there's joy in obedience for me. And I'm like, that's awesome. Okay, I want to follow Christ. I want to live life to the full. But sometimes I can forget that actually my pursuit of holiness or my lack of pursuit affects those around me. It affects my marriage and my wife. I mean, if you're married here, you'd know this. That if you're walking with Jesus, keeping step in the Spirit and loving Him, that your marriage usually goes well and is going well. Like, there might be some issues, but it's healthier than when you do the opposite. Or if you're a parent, like, you, like, you know that reality is that your sinfulness or your lack of desire to grow in Christ's likeness will affect your children. But it's even broader than that. Like, like have you thought this through? Even the person you're sitting to, next to tonight is affected by whether or not you're trying to grow to become like Christ or whether you're not. Every single week, all of us here, we're a family, and we're affected by whether or not we're trying to become more like Jesus or not. And I think we should remember this, that there's a need for our joy, but also for God's people, and they're good, that each of us be on this pursuit of holiness by the Spirit's help. And so with that in mind, with our need of sanctification in mind, let's have a look at the nature of sanctification. It's important we understand this before we get into the practical details. And so let's have a look at verses 16 to 18. Paul says this, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Um, I've got a confession for you. Uh, I don't like Lord of the Rings. Um, for some of you here, I'm like, oh no, what's wrong with you? Like, like I've got some redeeming qualities here. Um, I, I like watching the battle scenes in the Lord of the Rings, right? Okay, so like the rest of the movie, I'm just falling asleep. But like, I'm gonna, there's been times and again where I would just fast forward that movie until the battle scene and just be like, oh man, this is, this is awesome, right? And some of you are like, yeah, I do it too. Like, be honest, I know a lot of you do. I don't know about you, but for some reason, and maybe you think it's because I'm wicked, but like I find those battle scenes just really compelling. You know, seeing like good versus evil, like the two cosmic forces coming together. There's just something, I don't know, like amazing about it. Something that just like we find entertaining. 
which is why most movies are about, you know, cosmic forces going together. You know, we can see that battle and it blows us away, but I think what we're seeing here in the scriptures is Paul is saying to us, you know, that there's actually a cosmic battle going on for your soul that you can't see that is even more important. And it is, it is the battle between your flesh and the spirit. You see, for those of you here today who are followers of Jesus, you have your fleshly nature, but you've also got the spirit within you. And they are at war with each other. They have absolutely contrasting goals in your life. The flesh wants to drag you one way and the spirit wants to drag you another. And I think too often we're just naive or ignorant to these realities. And and what Paul is trying to say here is understand that there is a battle going on. And there's a nature when it comes to sanctification. So when you're trying to grow in holiness, there's two opposite forces that are dragging you in two different directions. And look, some days in this battle as a Christian, it's going to feel like a skirmish. Like, it's going to feel like a paintball match. And you're just going to take a few hits, but you're going to be like, no, I'm conquering this. I love Jesus. I'm going to kill that sin. No worries. I know my enemy. We've got this. But other days in the Christian walk, man, you're going to be struggling with some sort of addiction. You're going to be finding it really difficult to be motivated to read God's Word or to love His people. And it's going to feel like you're in World War II. And you're like, the enemy is like undefeatable. And like, where is the help? And this is why we need each other as a church. So that for those of us who are in the trenches and we're struggling with some sin or just struggling to to love Jesus, that we have brothers and sisters next to us encouraging us. This is why we need each other. This is why we have home groups. There's a reason why we have home groups. We just don't put them on because we want to make you busier or we think you don't have much to do. But we have this because we believe that it's in community that the Holy Spirit is at work, helping each other, encouraging each other to grow to become more like Christ. But on that when we're in home groups, may we be patient with one another. Because sometimes growth can be quick, and other times it can be really painfully slow. You know, as everyone knows, I've got two boys, Elijah and Isaac, um, and uh, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but they grow, right? I don't know if you've ever seen my boys, but they actually are growing up. They've gotten bigger since I've gotten here. Uh, and it, it, my wife, Emma's pregnant. She's got another uh, one inside her belly. It could be boy or girl, and that is growing, right? If you but if you were to look at my kids, they're not here tonight, but if they were, if you were to look at them and just study them and just, you know, look at them for like 10 minutes straight, like you wouldn't see any growth. And you'd be like, man, kids don't grow. That's a lie. You know, that's a conspiracy. But like in reality, you know, no, they do grow. And, and so it's the same with us in our Christian walk. Some things we can grow really quickly. Sometimes, some seasons, you grow quickly. But sometimes in life, maybe post the university period you get a bit older, sometimes growth takes time. And so we need to be patient with each other and patient with ourselves, knowing that God is patient with us. But another, another point when it comes to the nature of sanctification is I think there's two opposite errors that occur when it comes to, I guess, our role in sanctification. You see, I think some people think that trying to be grow in holiness, it's all about yourself. It's all about you putting in the hard yards. It's all about you reading the Bible. It's all about you going to church. It's all about you. That you can fix yourself. When the reality is, you can't. The reality is, is that each and every one of us here are broken people. That each and every one of us, if we try and live this life on our own strength, are going to fail. And so that's one error. And the other error, though, is to go that growing in holiness is all about God. He does it all. Absolutely, He does everything. And so what happens is you pray some prayers like, you know, God, please help me to love that really annoying co-worker. Help me to be patient with them. And then you go to work the next day and you snap at them. You don't love them. You don't say good morning. You don't care. Or maybe you pray another prayer and you're like, God, help me to overcome this addiction that I have. And you continue to stay in that addiction and not do anything about it. And then when you don't change, you go, well, God clearly doesn't answer prayer. You know, it clearly doesn't have the power to change. Me. Clearly the Spirit is not at work in my life. You see, it's important you understand that when you look at the Scriptures, what you'll see is that salvation is all God's work, but sanctification is a partnership with us and God. You know, as we continue to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that God is the one who works within us. And like to demonstrate this point, let me share with you an illustration that I uh, ripped off uh, this book by Francis Chan. Uh, and it's an illustration that goes like this. Uh, I want you to imagine that I need to lose some weight, or I want to lose some weight. Uh, and if some of you think, yeah, you should... Please don't say that. That's, that'd be nice if you don't. But uh, I want you to imagine that I go to Workout World. If I think that's a place. And um, I, I, I say to the guy, hey, look, I want to lose some weight. Like, what can I get to help me lose some weight? And the guy says to me, oh, buy a treadmill. 
Like, they're great. You'll, you'll lose weight. No worries. Buy a treadmill. And so I want you to imagine that I buy that treadmill. I take it back home to, you know, uh, Unidera, put it in my house. Uh, and then three months later, I pick it up and I take it all the way back to Workout World. And I go up to the guy who sold it to me. And I just say to him, this is ridiculous. I want a refund. Like, I did not lose one kilogram or one gram, nothing. I just, it just, just does not work. And then imagine if the sales assistant or guy is like, well, what, what do you mean does it work? Like, do you not know how to use it? Like, do you know how to like walk or like run? Do you want me to show you that? Or like, did you plug it in? Like, what do you mean it doesn't work? And then imagine if I was like, I don't know if it actually works. I never plugged it in, like, but I didn't lose weight. So clearly it doesn't work. Like, how ridiculous is that? You're like, Joel, it doesn't do it all. Like, you've got to get on the treadmill. You know, so does the same with sanctification. There's a partnership here. You know, the Spirit is at work. He's pressing you on your heart, things to do, but you still need to obey Him and then go do those things. And so it's important to remember that. The final thing in the nature before we get into the process is in verse 18. Paul says, but if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. In other words, he just wants to remind these Galatians who are so prone towards legalism. They're so prone to think they need to follow these rules and that will lead to change. That Paul's like, remember that you're a child of God. Earlier in Galatians, he said, it's by the Spirit that you cry out, Abba, Father. Remember that you don't need to do things to please God, that you're His children, that you're already adored in His sight. So why don't you go live as His children? And so let's keep that in mind when it comes to the nature of sanctification as we move on to the process and what this looks like practically, what this looks like practically. And to talk about this, I want us to look at verses 24 and 25, which should hopefully come up on the screen. This is what Paul says. He says that those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. You know how walking, for most of us, involves a two-step process. Well, sanctification is a, is a two-step process as well. It's one where you try to kill sin, and it's when you, when you pursue holiness. Or as theologians like to say, it's about mortification and vivification. Man, I can't say that word. Mortification and vivification. In other words, what you see in this passage is in verse, uh, verse 24, Paul says you've got to crucify the flesh. And then in verse 25, he, needs, he says you need to live by the Spirit. And so let's, let's talk about these two processes and how the Spirit works in these. And let's begin with uh, crucifying the flesh. Crucifying the flesh. One of the ways in which the Spirit works in our life is by convicting us of what is sin and convicting us as to what are acts of the flesh that don't give us joy but instead of a facade that lead to death. And so Paul gives us a list, actually, in verses 19 to 21, of what are some of the acts of the flesh that we should be trying to kill and stay away from. Now, this is not an uh, ex uh, exhaustive list that we're about to read out, but it's a list nevertheless. And so let me read it out to us. It should come up on the screen, hopefully. See what it's there. Verses 19 to 21, Paul says this. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, just to put some of you at ease here, uh, what Paul is talking about here when he says that those who do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God, he's talking about habits, he's not talking about one-off uh, actions, Okay, so if some of you were feeling envious when you walked in at my purple scooter, you're okay, all right? You can, you can relax, you can breathe, okay? Because um, clearly what Paul's already said to us is that there's a battle going in between the flesh and the spirit. And so there's going to be times where even if you're a follower of Christ, that potentially you're going to do these acts of the flesh. But the thing is, is that Christ doesn't want you to stay there. He doesn't want you to keep doing these. He said he wants you to pursue holiness and trying to kill these. And so look, I, I don't have time to go through all of these in detail. Um, as I was reading this week, uh, Bob gave me an article which is quite helpful and tried to categorize these 15 acts. Uh, you can look at the first three, which is uh, potentially sexual sins, so sexual immorality, uh, impurity, or debauchery. Um, look, I know this may be offensive, but what the Bible teaches is that any sexual act or relationship outside the beautiful marriage covenant is, is a sin and is immoral. Um, I, on top of sexual sins, though, he talks about religious sins of idolatry and witchcraft and then potentially social sins from hatred to drunkenness. Well, my guess is, is that some of us here, you know, some of these things hit a sore point. Some of these acts of the flesh, we're weak on. 
We're all different. And the Spirit wants to help us to kill these things. But what I want to say is this, is all of these acts of the flesh, every single one of them, are going to say to you that there is more pleasure, there's more joy, there's more satisfaction if you do these things. You know, that's what the world screams out at us. Like, ignore God's design for sex or for marriage. and Ignore the fact that He's a good God and He created sex in the first place and knows what's best, but just do whatever you want to do. That's where you're going to find joy. Or you don't worry about worshipping and praising Jesus because he deserves it. But instead, you know, worship something else. Worship sports and put all your money and energy into that. Worship your career or relationship. Don't worry about worshipping Jesus. That's where you find joy. Or, you know, don't worry about actually loving your neighbor. And, and just, but be, be jealous of them. Everyone's jealous. Be envious. Like, or, or cause division. Like, let's be honest. You, know, you shouldn't get along with everyone anyway. You know, I think in those moments, we know that our flesh is saying to us, hey, this is the path to life. And it's a complete lie. And it just leads to bankruptcy. And it's empty promises. Um, Before I was a pastor, I was a a civil engineer. And as a civil engineer, I worked in Wagga one time. Uh, And while I was working there, I worked with a bunch of guys. I think it was about 20 at the time. And they were really into shares. And so they were buying lots of shares, and they said to me, they're like, hey, Joel, you should buy shares. You'll get rich really quickly. You won't have to work the rest of your life. You should do it. And so I was young and naive, and so I'm like, yeah, cool, all right. I'm going to buy some shares. And so I did that, and I bought these mining uh, spec shares and paid like $500 for them. Um, and about, uh, I think for the next few months, they, they grew. And so I was like, yes, I'm going to get rich. This is awesome. Quit my job and everything. Uh, but then I think about six months later, the global financial crisis hit, and there went my shares. Uh, and then I decided to hold on to them after they failed because I'm like, oh, it's just a good reminder. And you never know, they might bounce back. Uh, and anyway, yesterday I got a letter uh, from one of the companies who have gone completely broke uh, to the point that they need to like, sell off whatever shares they got left. Uh, and so they, they gave me a check. And so I was really excited about this check. I'm like, oh, what's this going to be? And it was a check for a dollar and 25 cents. <laughs> What an investment. <laughs> now, you know what's incredible is these acts of the flesh, I want to be honest with you, that they're doing what my friends are doing with the shares. They're like, do this, this is going to bring you joy. Do this, this is a better long-term investment. Don't worry about God. What does Paul say? He says, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And actually, do you know what? In Galatians 6, Verse 8 says this, Whoever sows to please the flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Eternal life. And so, look, can I push in on this? If, if some of you here are, are struggling when it comes to sin, in particular, maybe some of these acts of the flesh, can I encourage you to kill it? Can I, can I encourage you to confess it, to let the Spirit work in your heart? And if you're wondering what does that look like, He's going to make you feel ashamed of your sin. As he convicts you of sin, he's going to make you just not stop thinking about something that you need to repent of and confess. And he does that because he loves you. And let him do that. Let him point you towards holiness. And can I just say this? Every single one of us here is broken. Every single one of us here have got issues that we need to deal with. No one here is perfect. We may put on this facade that we're all together, but we're not. And so understand that the church is actually a place that's more like a hospital where we're here, not because we're perfect, but because Jesus is. And so can I tell you that it's okay to not be okay, to to tell that to your home group, to tell that to those around you so they can support you, but speak into your life and remind you of the gospel, remind you of what Christ has done and how there's forgiveness and how you can change, and to help you as discern the Spirit as He convicts you of your sin. Because the Spirit wants to point you towards Christ. He wants you to not be destroyed, but to have eternal life. And He wants you to bear fruit. He wants you to bear fruit. See, step one of the process is mortification. Step two is vivification. In other words, it is walking with the Spirit. It is bearing fruit of the Spirit. Let me read to you Galatians 22, verse 23. It should hopefully come off the screen. Paul says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. My guess is if you've been in church for a little while, even if you haven't, you've probably come across this verse before, and you're like, yeah, yeah, okay, you get it, fruit of the Spirit, and you, know, you don't really look at it and actually get blown away by it. 
Uh, yesterday, uh, I was building a retaining wall with my dad, uh, and on uh, Friday night, he called me up to tell me when he was going to come, uh, like what time, and also he had a present for my boys, and so he wanted to talk to the boys and tell them that he bought these toy cars, and so I put the phone next to my son uh, Isaac, and when my dad said, hey Isaac, I've got a present for you, uh, my son Isaac just went, <gasps> and like started shaking with joy. Um, I don't know about you, but I've never done that in like years. <laughs> But, you know, when we come to this verse, and in particular when it comes to the process of sanctification, you know what, we should be like, <gasps> like, like we can grow, we can change. Like if our heart is unloving towards people, that Christ can make us loving. If we're feeling depressed and lacking in joy, that the Spirit help, can help us to be joyful. That if we, if we struggle with being kind or good or gentle or self-controlled, that the Spirit can help you to do that, you can change. That's what I love about following Jesus. I'm not the man I used to be. I'm not the man that I desperately want to be, but I am growing. I am changing by the power of the Spirit. How amazing is that? Hopefully, we realize this, that Christ wants to change you, that He can and He will, that He wants you to bear fruit and become more like Jesus. That may should make us go, but also, can I remind you of this? Is I think sometimes we, we realize, okay, when it comes to sin, okay, the Spirit convicts us, and then we need to listen to that conviction and go kill that sin. But when it comes to bearing the fruit, it's a similar process. As He puts on your heart, hey, go talk to that person after church. Hey, give that person a phone call who's struggling. When He, when he says to you, hey, the Spirit pushes on your heart and says, hey, how great is the gospel? Like, shouldn't you sing about it in church? How amazing that is. You still have a choice. You have a choice as to whether or not you're going to go love that person. You have a choice as to whether or not you're going to be joyful. You have a choice. So remember that, that when, even when it comes to growing in holiness and bearing fruit, that the Spirit is inviting you into something deeper and He wants you to obey Him because it leads to greater joy for you and good for God's people and glory for God. Look, when it comes to this topic of sanctification, uh, if I was to use another word to explain it, sanctification is similar to like change management process. All right, I'm guessing some of you have been in the workforce, you know that change management is really important. Uh, now, why is that the case? It's because nobody likes change. All right, we all like to be comfortable. We don't want things to change because that's just you know, that's scary. And you know, when it comes to sanctification, it's the same thing. You know, the, the, if we're honest, we sort of like how we are right now, a lot of us. We, you know, we're, we're sure we have some sins, but they're acceptable sins. I don't really want to have to deal with them. I'm okay with that. And when it comes to our level of pursuit of holiness, like, yeah, I have a certain level, but I don't want to be like a radical Christian. I don't want to be like Ned Flanders. I don't want to be like those crazy dudes. So I'm like, I'm content where I am right now. I don't want to change. And look, I, I, I fall into that category. Don't hear me preach that to you and not me. And so look, this, something I want to remind you of, and I'm hopeful that this sermon has done this for you, is that this is a, a change management principle in general. Uh, you will never change until the pain of not changing, right, the pain of not changing is greater than the pain of change. You'll never change until the pain of not changing is greater than the pain of change. And so look, my hope is this tonight, if you think like, oh, I don't know if I want to change. There's pain in me being humble and confessing my sin. There's, there's pain in me wanting to grow in holiness and trust in the Spirit as He guides me in that. Can I just say to you, there's even greater pain if you don't follow His lead that there's greater pain for you and, you, and you're missing out. On top of that, you're missing out on joy. You should have, like, was it FOMO, fear of missing out, when it comes to growing in holiness. Because the Spirit is inviting us into something deeper. And look, this is the, the final thing I want to say for this sermon and for this topic of sanctification, is that for those of us here who are followers of Jesus, you know what's really important is that you understand that Christ has already defeated sin, that He's already conquered sin at the cross, and on top of that, He's already given you His holiness. He's already made you holy in God's sight. Like the victory has been won. Yes, there's a battle right now, but remember that in God's sight, you are made holy. Your sin is dealt with. That there is eternity to come. And so let's live like that's the case. Let's kill sin knowing that Christ has killed it. And let's be holy because we've been made holy. And if you're not a believer here tonight, can I encourage you? that you're never going to actually become more like Jesus. You're never going to reach a certain level of holiness to be entered into heaven. It's about grace. And so I can encourage you to accept Christ tonight, that He has killed your sin on your behalf, that He can change you, that He can make you more holy, and that there's greater joy in doing so, both for you and for those around you. How about I pray to close? 
Father God, when it comes to your Holy Spirit, I think sometimes we can uh, long for the miraculous. We can read the book of Acts and think, you know what, I want to be like Philip and be transported to different locations. I want to like raise the dead. And yet what we see time and time again is that you give us your Holy Spirit so that we become more like Jesus. Yes, the Spirit works in other ways, but the main work of the Spirit is, is holiness and sanctification. And so, Lord, help us not to forget that. Help us to have a hunger and a desire to become more like Christ. Help us, Lord, to recognize the realities of the battle that we're in. And help us, Lord, to put to death the deeds of the flesh, to crucify it. Even though such crucifixion can be painful, there can be shame in that, Lord. Remind us that there is joy in obedience. Remind us, Lord, that there is eternal life to come for those who sow in the Spirit and listen to Him. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.